the shooting range. In this episode, Pages of History, The Flying Guerrilla Fighter by Nikolai Polikarpov. Tactics and strategy, learning the way of the multiple rocket launcher and metal beasts, a stealthy German Hetzer. The Jagdpanzer 38T is a sneaky German tank destroyer built on the chassis of the Czechoslovak Panzer 38T light tank. It sits at BR 4.3. Many know this vehicle under a different name, the Hetzer, which means an instigator or a firebrand. Very fitting for a vehicle that was built for ambushes and surprise attacks. When compared to giants like the SU-100Y, or the three-inch gun carrier, the Hetzer seems rather tiny. Don't let that fool you, though. This tank destroyer is both well-armored and well-armed. Its main means of destruction is the 75mm Pac-39 cannon with depression elevation angles of minus 6 and plus 10 degrees. You get limited angles of traverse, up to 5 degrees to the left, and to 11 to the right. Your secondary is the roof-mounted MG-34 machine gun. The front of the vehicle is protected by 60 millimeters of armor with the LFP sloped at 40 degrees and the UFP at 60. The mantlet is just as thick with the area around it covered by 70 millimeters of cast armor. The transmission is located in the front, the engine in the rear and your ammo in one of the most dangerous ways possible, along the sides. The crew consists of four men. You get five different rounds to play with, but you'd probably rely on the APCBC round. It doesn't have much explosive filler, but can penetrate up to 140 millimeters of steel. The gun has a pretty good fire rate as well. With a maxed out crew, it takes less than six seconds to reload. The only notable flaw of the cannon is the fact that it has limited depression and traverse angles. You will often be forced to change the position of your vehicle to help you aim. The Hetzer excels in long-range engagements, and when striking from an ambush, try to find yourself a spot where your upper front plate is angled at a favorable angle all the while the more vulnerable lower glacier is safe from enemy fire. Also keep in mind that with the gun placed to the right of the vehicle, it has a limited traverse range to the left. This is not a glass cannon though. Enemies will have a tough time trying to deal with a Hetzer controlled by an experienced player. First, you have to locate it behind bushes or <laughs> a pile of rubble, and then try to penetrate its considerable front defenses. Upper Glacier is thick enough and sloped at an angle favorable enough to tank at least a couple of hits, and even if an enemy achieves penetration, the round will sometimes just hit the massive transmission. On the other hand, the Jagdpanzer 38T is very vulnerable in CQC. You'll be sent to the hangar with the very first shell coming from the side, and a tank with high enough profile has a chance of penetrating the Hetzer right through the front by using its size to effectively getting a better angle to shoot at you. Also remember that this tank destroyer can't keep up with medium tanks, especially if it has to climb a hill or two along the way. Its 160 horsepower engine is simply a bit weak for a vehicle that heavy. The Hetzer is a vehicle built for sniping and sneaky ambush action it's best used away from the thick of things. What a strange thing to do. It's 1937. The militaries of the world are steadily getting more and more into fast monoplane fighter aircraft. The excellent ME-109 
has already made its debut in the skies of Spain, for goodness sake. Regardless of all that, Nikolai Polikarpov, the Soviet king of fighter aircraft, suggests a modernization package for the I-15 biplane. And what's even more surprising, gets the official's approval. Let's remind you once again, that's happening at the time when the I-16 monoplane fighters are already heralding the start of a new era during military parades in the skies above the Red Square. It's hard to understand the reasons behind that decision when looking at it from the perspective of the 21st century. We knew that war was coming after all, but then for the USSR, the war was seemingly looming from the east, with the Japanese deemed a priority threat, and the Japanese, though already making the switch from the biplane aircraft to monoplane fighters, still valued maneuverability above all. In that regard, the idea to give Soviet pilots both the fast I-16 and, and the agile I-153 Chaika seemed pretty reasonable. Biplanes would tie the enemy in a dogfight, dragging them to low altitudes, and the I-16 would then easily deal with them, falling from above with superior speed. That's exactly the tactic which gave the Soviets the victory in the skies of Kalkin Gol, by the way. Furthermore, even the upgraded variant of the biplane with better aerodynamics and a more streamlined design would still be a great candidate for the role of the flying guerrilla fighter. Or simply put, an aircraft that can land almost anywhere and take off from almost anywhere. Obviously, Chaika would be slower than literally any monoplane of the new generation, but what was important was that it could strike from anywhere. The enemy would then have to make sense of the situation, scramble its own aircraft. By that point, Soviet biplanes would be long gone, safely parked under a camouflage net somewhere under a tree. Or you could use its amazing maneuverability to harass enemy pilots. And while they're too busy trying to score a hit on the damn thing, lead them to your own AA guns. So that's how it went. But you might say, Surely the biplanes were used only at the very start of the war. <laughs> nope. For example, the Soviet ace and a Chaika enthusiast Viktor Ivanov was able to shoot down a Fokker Wolf FW200 Condor in his Chaika. In 1943, he took to the skies from a tiny advance airfield and intercepted a four-engined aircraft. Germans certainly didn't expect to be intercepted so far behind their own lines. Well, their mistake. Four quick-firing Schkas guns tore through their plane in seconds, and that's just one example. Chaikas were fighting and scoring till the very end of the war. That won't come as a surprise to the veterans of the game. In War Thunder, Chaika is almost like a fighter aircraft that exists out of a BR system. Almost. Extremely dangerous in low-tier battles, this old-fashioned biplane has a fighter's chance to win when engaging top piston-engine aircraft or even jets, all thanks to its amazing maneuverability. Or it can give its team an unexpected victory by clinging to the ground and sneakily getting to the designated target behind rocks and groves. Always a flying, always a mocking. Come get me at my low altitude. <laughs> and that's when the fun starts. Multiple rocket launcher vehicles aren't a common sight on the battlefields of War Thunder. They're usually hard to use and, as a general rule, are only implemented as event or premium vehicles. But if you know how to play them, those MRLs are capable of clearing the field. No armor can save you if you're caught in the middle of a rocket barrage. Let's see how you can tame these beasts, get the most out of their firepower, and simply have as much fun in the process as humanly possible. All MRL vehicles in the game come in two flavors, pure tank destroyers and tanks with launchers. In the first case, rockets are mounted on a lightly armored platform, a towing vehicle or a truck. A distinct representative of this class of vehicles is the German Panzerwerfer. The launcher, mounted on an Opel half-track, 
is capable of firing 10 rockets at once, showering your enemies with a hail of explosions. Furthermore, given that every rocket weighs about 40 kilos, it's not just direct hits that they should be worried about. At first glance, it seems clear that this is not a vehicle for the front line. There is no armor, and the launcher is no tank turret when it comes to convenience of use. On the other hand, rockets travel on complex trajectories and can easily go off coming in contact with see-through obstacles, which means that long-distance engagements are also out of the question. What should you do then? Just forget what you know. In fact, MRL vehicles of this type perform really well at medium and even close range. Their power lies in their incredible suppression capabilities and superior firepower. Even if you missed with a single rocket, you can always follow with another two or three. And even if that failed to eliminate the target, you at least knock its gun out and damage other modules. At the same time, these kinds of tank destroyers are often on the smaller side, making it easy to hide their vulnerable hulls behind cover. Sometimes you can even deal with several opponents at once. Just don't ever get cocky. On the Panzerwerfer, for instance, you have only 10 rockets max in your launcher at any given time, and a reload takes a lot of time. Furthermore, the vehicle doesn't have the best power-to-weight ratio. The half-track is pretty mobile on even ground, but elevated terrain can certainly be a problem. When it comes to tank destroyers of this type, the Soviet BM-13N, or the legendary Katyusha, is in a spot of its own. It has the capability of tilting the front down, more or less like the Japanese MBTs with their fancy hydropneumatic suspension systems. But in the case of the Katyusha, that simply simulates the act of digging in. At the same time, the vehicle has a gun depression of plus 8 degrees. Yep, that's why it's a good idea to stick to long-range engagements. Now, let's take a gander at the second type of MRLS vehicles. That's when the launcher is mounted on a tank. A prime example of this design is the T-34 Calliope with a launcher mounted on the turret of a Sherman that has a pretty high profile on its own. Or the British Cromwell armed with a bunch of RP-3 rockets. These vehicles aren't simply tank destroyers. These are true tanks coming with all the strengths of the type. The Sherman makes for a great frontline fighter, especially when getting really close and personal with the enemy. Even with a damaged gun, you still have the Calliope to engulf the opponent in a storm of flames, and the sufficient armor to provide some protection to your modules and crew. Engage enemy vehicles with your gun first. This way, you won't have to deal with limited visibility due to all the clouds of dust. Then, if your cannon isn't enough, use your rocket trump car. The Cromwell also performs better in CQC, but due to a different reason, the British vehicle has next to no armor, and its rockets are rigidly mounted in a locked position. You simply can't really aim with those when shooting from a distance. Its gun, though, has pretty decent elevation, and the tank itself is really agile, making this vehicle a great pick for players that can be both aggressive and cautious, and know when to be what. When it comes to surprise flanking maneuvers and lightning quick attacks at medium range or up close, this British vehicle performs really, really well. The first message was sent by Anthony Good. Why did you remove the mouse? Hi, Anthony. We really like the mouse, but it's in a kind of a weird spot in the game. Its thick armor doesn't save it from powerful post-war rounds, especially heats, since it lacks any kind of ERA. And if we try to make it easier for a mouse a bit by dropping its BR even slightly, it becomes almost invincible. This is truly a unique vehicle and it's exactly its uniqueness that makes it extremely hard to place within the game system these days. But don't fret, we do not remove the mouse per se. If you already own one, it won't go anywhere. 
Even if you just started researching it, it'll still be possible for you to add it to your collection at any point in the future. The only players that won't be able to get it are those who completely avoided it by this point in time. Moreover, the mouse will still be available to the larger public as an event vehicle. A user called Verbalwind has a suggestion for us. Pages of history, FW200 Condor, the airliner that went to war. Sure, why not? Our Pages of History writer is already ablaze with ideas. <laughs> Somebody please get a fire extinguisher. Carolis Griebe asks, How did World War II planes know their speed? There wasn't any GPS technologies or anything like that. Well, that wasn't easy for sure. At some point, to measure the true speed of an aircraft relative to the ground, pilots had to rely on notable map features used as reference points, or sometimes even on stars. Later, as radar technology became in commonplace, tracking airplane positions and speeds became trivial. It was all in the palm you get back from the radio signal. Pilots also tracked the so-called indicated airspeed with the help of a manometric device getting data on airflow resistance. That's exactly how you get the IAS numbers in your cockpit. As you've probably guessed, when encountering tailwind, your IAS will be lower than the ground speed, and when running into headwind, the other way around. A player called Music Gaming asks, can you do a climb in the ranks with British aircraft, please? I want to see what they're capable of. We will make guides for all aircraft tech trees sooner or later, just like we do with the ground vehicle ones. If you're very keen on seeing the British climbing the ranks, though, then so be it. We'll give it a higher priority. And the last very serious message was sent by a user called Fraud Bacon. I'm already subscribed. Does that make me a man? <laughs> Obviously. That's it for today. That was The Shooting Range by Gaijin Entertainment. Subscribe to the channel if you're not Fraud Bacon. Of course, he's already subscribed. Click on the bell button, leave a like, and tell us what you think in the comments below. See you in a week, folks.